Welcome to Decrypt, Asia's first blockchain and cryptocurrency podcast. I'm your host, Tushar. Each week, we take a deep dive into the Asian blockchain scene with investors, technologists, and industry insiders. Go to decrypt.asia to subscribe to our newsletter and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Telegram to join in the discussions. Welcome to the show, Alex. Thanks, Tushar. Nice to be here. Could you give our listeners a quick introduction? Tell us about your background and how you got involved in the blockchain and cryptocurrency ecosystem. Hi, everyone. My name is Alex Wern. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Aurora, the creators of IDEX Decentralized Exchange. My background is one of economics and software development. Uh, coming up out of undergrad, I joined a marketing analytics startup out in the San Francisco Bay Area where we were using econometric models to figure out the optimal pricing and promotional strategies for grocery stores, drug stores, and the products and and services within them. Um, After doing that for six years, I had a heavy product focus while I was there working closely with the engineers to understand what the customers needed and and how to build the right product for them. I went back to get my MBA and, and master's in design and innovation with a real focus on getting more involved in the product side of the organization. Um, Coming out of that, I spent about a year at Amazon, during which I was working on this project, IDEX, um, after which we were able to gain enough traction that I was able to jump into it full time. In terms of kind of my involvement in cryptocurrency, uh, like many people, I first heard about it in 2011, 2012, uh, made my first purchase back in 2012 of a small amount of Bitcoin. Uh, Coming from a traditional economics background, I, I wasn't sure what to make of it at first. I got hung up on the fact that there was no central issuer, no government uh, there to guarantee redemption of the asset, no guarantee on the ability to pay taxes. Uh, and I overlooked the aspect of the fact that the technology and the asset itself has unique properties that were never seen before. In, in particular, this notion of digital scarcity, the idea that you have a digital asset that cannot just be created on a whim, control C, control V, as, as every other piece of digital information had been uh, up until that point. And that this control did not depend on a central actor managing that supply or managing that uh, quantity of this, this, in this case, scarce digital asset. So the, the fact that it's a scarce digital resource, it's kind of community managed and then can be sent anywhere in the world without censorship, that in and of itself has value. How much value, we don't seem to know yet. I think that's a lot of why the market speculation is as it is, where individuals find out about it, make a decision, yes or no, on whether or not they find it interesting, and then decide whether or not to dig into it further. Um, Anyway, so I had made the jump into crypto and then really became enamored by Ethereum and this notion of programmatic assets, the idea that you could have not only scarce digital tokens, but also build into those assets rules and logic under which they could be transferred or transform in value, all sorts of creative ideas coming out of it. And that's where we started focusing on the idea of decentralized exchange uh, and started working on IDEX. Um, So we started working on it in November of 2016, and we had test versions up by the summer of 2017, went live in October of last year. So before we get into and dig deeper into IDEX, you kind of hinted and touched on this in your introduction as well. Uh, You define Aurora as a decentralized financial institution. Could you elaborate a little bit more on what that means? So for the time being, we're focused on our first primary product, IDEX, to facilitate decentralized exchange. The goal being to create a software layer that currently on the Ethereum blockchain, but eventually expanding to ideally all blockchains that allows the uh, peer-to-peer transaction or, or swap of these native digital assets. But we really, our focus is, is holistically on reinventing and rethinking about the financial system with decentralized technology at its core. And another area that we're really focused on and really interested in is the issuance of money itself and this notion of a private currency. So this is an idea that has actually been around for hundreds of years. It's actually only recently that governments have uh, maintained strict control over currency issuance. And we think there's a couple of compelling attributes of the technology that make this idea worth revisiting. Uh, This notion that a private 
uh, entity, or in this case, a network, can issue a currency and have it be backed by, by other assets or other value. Uh, so we have in plans, and we'll probably dig into this a little bit, but we have plans to release our own stable asset that will be backed by the exchange itself. The idea is that it's redeemable on IDEX at its target value in lieu of trade fees. If it ever drops below that target value, traders will be incentivized to purchase it because they'll be able to lower their overall trading costs. Once that asset is more widely circulated, we have plans to start lending that via the blockchain. I think you can kind of extrapolate out that the identity layer, someone's gonna crack that nut, so to speak, and you're gonna have uh, the, the notion of identity on the blockchain, and those identities will be valuable based on economic history and building up uh, a history of trustworthiness and honest transactions. And we think people will eventually be able to use those identities and, and coupled with real world, uh, uh, kind of real world, um, I guess, recourse if someone isn't doesn't repay their loan in order to start lending via the blockchain in this case to lend our stable coin that's backed by the exchange network so i'm going to dig into the stable asset as we go, you know go further wrong in the interview but what problems do you think exist in the current way that the financial institutions are set up that you're trying to address so my our our contention with the current financial system is that uh, there's a system of, there's an issue with moral hazard. And, and by that we mean there's actions that individuals and institutions will take that are in their best interest, but the system is not set up properly uh, in order to, I guess, either punish them or encourage them to not act that way. So let me give an example. So the, one of the things that we kind of look at closely and you know want to kind of explore, as I mentioned, is this notion of a private currency, which would be an alternative to a central bank currency. The challenge or the contention that we have with central bank currencies is not that uh, they are necessarily nefarious or um, just you know setting out to capture all of these gains or, or kind of manipulate the market for their own benefit. Uh, it's that it's actually in their mandate to do a lot of the actions that they, they currently do. So, for example, the U.S. Federal Reserve, their stated, stated job is to balance the tension between unemployment and inflation within the U.S., so help manage business cycles within the U.S. economy. Now, they act uh, upon their best judgment on what will be what will work to manage the US economy. However, as you can as, as you've seen over the last you know 20, 30 years, we've become a more global society, a more global connected economy. And those decisions that are good for the US, the US's business cycles and the US's currency can be detrimental to our neighbors, our trading partners, others throughout the world. And the US is in this fortunate position where the monetary policy is kind of predicted and anticipated by others in the world, um, and the U.S. can kind of get away with this behavior, so to speak, uh, where they can actually control the supply in an attempt to control the business cycles within the U.S. Now, there's other economists that will debate whether or not the Federal Reserve's actions are even successful. Um, we think that the the question is is should they even have the uh, kind of the control over the money supply to uh, try and achieve what are clearly political goals in terms of, um, you know, these, the, the notion of how do you uh, help influence business cycles within your own national economy. So there's other countries that don't have that luxury. Perfect example being some of what's going on in South America, where you have sovereign states that have their own currency, try to get away with some of the uh, kind of, the, the term is seniorage, but the ability to print additional funds and use that cash or that uh, infusion of capital for you know, different, different government programs. And you see the negative impact that it can have if those assets grow too quickly and the money supply starts to be devalued and, and individuals lose trust in the currency itself. So this isn't, uh, the, the, our, our idea is really about using the transparency of blockchains uh, to, to take this notion of currency and create it as a private currency that's backed by this network. And in doing so, we want to be more open on the, the kind of monetary policy of the currency, as well as the uh, kind of conditions or the current supply and intentions in terms of changing supply in the future. 
Right. So what you just mentioned is kind of aligned to the concept of free banking, which is something that you mentioned in your white paper as well, which is essentially that each bank is responsible for its own solvency and the bank which provides the better solution or better product or better services over a period of time kind of wins. And it, you, you mentioned the problem of moral hazard, which is, which is something that the concept of free banking could potentially remove. But if we imagine a world where the concept of free banking is flourishing, which sounds fancy, but how does an everyday individual who does not have the time or the capability to assess the solvency of a bank kind of assess what bank should he or she use and not be worried about their money vanishing? This is a great question. So um, just to elaborate a little bit on the notion of free banking. So the idea is that private companies will be responsible for managing their own money supply or private banks. And this is uh, maybe just to take a step back. So this is where it was historically before a lot of the consolidation on under government control in terms of monetary policy and issuance. And there were definitely many issues with banks not being uh, honest or transparent, as well as having a lack of ability to properly manage the risk of the assets that they had on their balance sheet in terms of the loans that they were giving out. So without going into too much detail, we think that um, this that the changes in technology, in particular in terms of communication, as well as the transparency of blockchain, make it so that this idea is worth revisiting. Um, now your question specifically was, okay, that's if it's more, you know, I would say that if it's more open, more transparent, and others can uh, kind of more quickly assess the solvency or health of a bank, that's going to improve and help address that issue that you said, which was how does the individual consumer have time to understand uh, whether or not the, these, these individual banks are healthy. Um, and I do think that you would probably see a financial services layer on, on top of it. So if you extrapolate out this notion that there's going to be uh, a lot of independent free banks, you could have a layer on top of it that says, okay, we believe these are AAA rated banks and all of these assets, all of their currencies together uh, create this, this um, larger stable coin. So there's um, kind of an aside, but there's a project I've seen that's pretty interesting. They're doing index of different tokens and one of their tokens is an index of other stable coins, which I thought was a pretty interesting approach to that it adds a lot of value in the sense that it's looking at, there's a lot of unique approaches to stable coins, but this helps hedge the individual risk of any one of those particular projects. What is this project or token called? Uh, it's called Token Sets. Token Sets. Token Sets. All right. All right, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about your existing product, which is IDEX, uh, which is a decentralized exchange or semi-decentralized exchange. Could you tell our listeners a little bit more about it? So as you mentioned, it's a, we, we call it a hybrid decentralized exchange. And that term refers to how we utilize the smart contract within our larger infrastructure. So like all decentralized exchanges, the core component that makes them decentralized, or in our case, hybrid decentralized, is the use of a smart contract for all custody of funds, trade, and settlement. What that means is that any funds that move in and out of the exchange or in between between uh, individuals trading on the platform, all those transfers have to be authorized by the end user's private key. So this helps diffuse the security risk because the exchange itself is unable to move anyone's funds without their authorization. So you as a user can trade on IDEX knowing that as long as you keep your private keys safe, there's no risk of your funds being stolen, no risk of an outside actor um, or someone getting into the exchange and getting control of their wallet system. Now, the difference between IDEX and other exchanges has to do with how trades are dispatched to the network for processing. So on most decentralized exchanges, uh, you've got similar to other exchanges, you have a maker and taker. Each of them are signing their, their relevant side of the transaction in order to agree to a specific trade. On other decentralized exchanges, it's the taker that is then responsible for submitting the final transaction that includes both sides to the network for processing. What that means is that there's a little bit of a delay between when the taker submits it to the network and when the transaction actually mines. So you have this period where the transaction's kind of sitting out there, both parties have agreed to it, but it hasn't actually settled. During this period, others can actually come along and see that trade 
uh, that existing order and submit their own order to try to fill that same uh, resting limit order. The user or the, on the taker or maker side could also move their funds during that settlement process using a higher gas price in order to make the trade fail. So there's an opportunity to actually back out of a trade after you've agreed to one in principle. So it leads to these components of either race conditions or um, a lack of um, assuredness that the trade's actually going to settle, which can be difficult for market makers or those who are trying to use trading bots for more sophisticated trading strategies. So on IDEX, we've solved this by bringing the process of trade dispatch and bringing it through the exchange itself. So the maker and taker both sign their transaction, but the, tra the signed transaction is turned over to the exchange for submission to the smart contract for settlement. What that means is that the users have a look, a feel, it's, it's got the speed of a centralized exchange with the security of a smart contract for all funds, transfers, and settlements. So when you make a trade, your balance is updated in real time, the order books are updated immediately, while behind the scenes, the transaction and the trade is dispatched to the smart contract to ensure that the smart contract always stays in sync with what the off-chain database is displaying to users. You know, so I've, I've used IDEX quite a bit in the past and I'm, I'm a huge fan. I mean, I love what you guys have built. Thank you, thank you, appreciate that. Yeah. So how do you ensure sufficient liquidity on IDEX? Do you work actively with market makers, liquidity providers? We have, uh, there's some market makers that we've been using to refer projects to. Um, you know, that's one of the things that I think is important on day one for a project and something that I didn't appreciate as much before being, you know, more, more closely involved in this space is the value that day one liquidity can provide for price discovery. So, you know, when these assets first launch, often the market's trying to figure out what the price of this asset should be. And if there's not sufficient liquidity on both sides, then a quick move in either direction can set kind of the tone for that asset going forward. Either some early investors decide they want to sell or some early token sale purchasers want to sell or others that weren't able to get in want to buy. And a quick move in either direction can kind of set the tone for the rest of the market. So we encourage projects when they're coming on board uh, to, to explore the idea of market making because it will help with the overall long-term health of the project. And we ourselves, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, would you work with this market maker as well, or it's the burden is sort of on the project to engage a market maker? In general, we, we encourage the project to engage with the market maker. We have not done any market making engagements ourselves. Uh, it is something we're, we're exploring though, in particular around what I'll call the some of the legacy Ethereum tokens, those that, are more established, so to speak, have you know, 10 to 20 million of daily volume on some of the larger exchanges. We think that uh, deep order books and tight spreads, that with the um, benefit of using a private key, uh, that you can compete against those centralized exchanges, provided that you have a UX like IDEX that's actually that's on par with what others are offering. What were the key challenges while setting up IDEX? There were a couple of them. So user acquisition is always a challenge. So we were coming on the, we released our products right around the time that Zero X went live. There were a couple other relayers. Uh, there was already some competition in the space. So being able to get those users on board and, and, and keep them um, during the ups and downs of the cryptocurrency market have definitely been a challenge. Uh, the other one that comes to mind is just operating on the Ethereum network and then in the fact that the Ethereum network is a live and very dynamic uh, system that you are not 100% in control in, in control of, um, you know, in any time in, in kind of software services, you want to minimize the variability of the environment in which you're operating. And in this case, you have the Ethereum network, which can you know, overnight be clogged up by transactions from some new project, some new exchange. Uh, in particular, gas prices have been an interesting challenge where one minute it can be hovering around a certain level and then it can spike up to 10x within an hour. And if we're not careful, um, you know, we need to make sure that the transactions we're dispatching are continuously getting mined or else we risk a backlog 
um, happening where the subsequent transactions can't mine until previous ones do. So we've actually built some pretty sophisticated tooling and systems that understand what is the current gas price, how are gas prices changing dynamically, and how do we need to adjust what we're doing on the dispatch side in order to make sure that there aren't transaction backlogs. All right, so the first challenge that you mentioned was user acquisition. Did you do anything in particular, especially in the early days to acquire users? I think a lot of it was on the, just the community involvement. So we made sure that we were very active in Telegram. We, uh, I think one of our, our smarter decisions was we brought on four or five full-time support people so that we could have 24 seven support coverage um, pretty early on. Uh, we found those in the community that were already participating and were interested in kind of helping out, you know, if they're already answering questions in their spare time and offer them an opportunity to, to work more formally with us. And I think that was really uh, an important step just because if you think about it from the customer's perspective, if they're on the exchange and they're asking questions, they're ready to purchase. And the decentralized exchange, cryptocurrency is already a pretty technical product. And decentralized exchange is even more technical. So you'd hate to have a customer who's ready to commit and turns away because they weren't able to figure out the site. Um, and I think this is a bit of an aside, but I think one of the interesting things we discovered is that there's a few kind of mental um, shifts that are required to really understand what it is that you're doing when you're trading on a decentralized exchange. In particular, this notion that um, identity or accounts is typically something that's maintained within the website. You create a username and password and then you send your cryptocurrency to that account in order to start trading. In this case, we had to educate people that on IDEX, the account is actually not technically associated with IDEX, it's a traditional Ethereum wallet. So we'd get questions all the time that said, hey, I've created my IDEX wallet, uh, now I wanna send my currency from my, my Ether wallet to my IDEX wallet. And we'd have to step in and say, hey, you can do that, but it's actually not necessary. The wallet you already have is interoperable with IDEX. So that's just an example of how using this different architecture, using the Ethereum network for operations, requires a, di a bit of a shift in mindset on the consumer side and having support there available to answer their questions and help clarify how this is different, how this is similar, I think was really helpful to making sure that customers were able to get in and, and use the system the first time. Right, so and the second point that you mentioned, the second challenge that you mentioned was about the Ethereum network itself. Uh, so could you talk a little bit about how you manage that volatility in terms of gas prices on the Ethereum network and in general, the fee structure uh, in terms of how it works currently? The fee structure is similar to other exchanges. We have a 10 basis points fee on the maker and a 20 basis point fee on the taker. The network fee for the Ethereum network is paid by the taker. So the taker is the one who pays the gas cost of dispatching that trade to the network and, and having it mined. So the first step in the kind of tooling was, or the first question I should say was, what gas price should we be using for that dispatch process? And uh, we were fortunate enough that by the time we were operating, ETH gas station was available and they had an API that we could plug into. So they were doing some basic analysis of previous blocks and understanding what was the average gas price, how quickly were different transactions at different gas prices mining. And they gave you a, an estimation that said, if you use this gas price, it'll be done in call it 10 minutes. This one will be done in less than two minutes. And so we started by just using one of the prices within there, but we found that if, uh, if, if gas prices spiked quickly or early on, largely due to ICOs, that it could lead to the, the, the dispatch uh, transactions falling behind, so to speak, that the price did not adjust quickly enough to stay on top of the, the actual current gas price required to get through. So that's where we actually had to bring some of this tooling in house and come up with our own systems that were a little quicker to react uh, to the changes in gas price in the network. Um, another thing that we did was moving towards this notion of limiting the number of pending transactions that we have out in the, it's called the mempool. Um, so uh, if you have too many transactions pending, you can actually have a situation where miners 
can have difficulty finding the next one using that notion of the Ethereum nonce, but finding the next transaction that's going to be mined. So by withholding certain transactions until the ones ahead of them had mined, we we're able to make sure that overall we had a faster rate at which transactions were getting through. And if there was a sudden bump up in the gas costs, would you absorb those costs? Yes, if we ever needed to redispatch, we always just absorb the costs uh, on our on our end. Um, so obviously, that's a good incentive to make sure that we're not falling too far behind. Um, actually, early days when we had very few customers, CryptoKitties came out, and we actually had to make the tough decision. We were, you know, had very little capital, and we had to spend a significant portion of it pushing through a big backlog just because gas prices had spiked from. Uh, call it 50 cents a trade to almost $10 a trade. Uh, so that was a painful but um, important lesson uh, early on in, in how, how critical it is to uh, accurately and adequately manage this component of the operation. Right, and the other uh, component that you talked about was limiting transactions. How would you go about limiting transactions? So this is simply making sure that in terms of dispatching transactions that we're letting the existing transactions clear the queue and if necessary uh, broadcasting them again with a higher gas price so the idea is you don't want to have thousands of transactions pending in the and it's called the memory pool but it's basically the, the pool of pending transactions and and you can imagine if gas price spikes suddenly um, you know maybe it was at one GUA and now it's at a hundred if you have a single transaction of one GUA that's at the front of every other transaction with 100, it's actually going to prevent the rest of those from mining. So this notion of batching is really about making sure that um, we never, we, we don't kind of unnecessarily dispatch additional transactions before we've uh, made sure that the ones at the front of the queue are, are clearing. Right, that makes sense. So you mentioned margin lending on IDEX in the future. Could you talk a little bit more about how this was this would work? If I'm a lender, how do you in, how do I ensure that my Ethereum assets are secure? I mean, would they be locked up in a smart contract or like how do you give so, I guess solace to the lender that these funds are not just going to vanish? Yeah, so margin lending, we, we've explored it a little bit. I think we're excited by a lot of the different, there's a couple of different projects that are trying to tackle it. Um, and we haven't spoken with them recently, but I know they're making some pretty good progress on it. I think this is an area where we would really like to keep focusing on our core competency, which is building the best exchange UX with a smart contract at its core and have other partners uh, bring their expertise into how to create the margin lending system within the contract. Um, so I don't have a great answer on a technical level on, on how that would be done. Um, just that there's been a lot of good groups that we've been speaking with that have promising projects and have uh, seemed to have a, a way to, to crack that problem. Right. So we've talked about the exchange IDEX. Let's, about, uh, let's talk about the other component of the Aurora ecosystem which is the cryptocurrency bank, uh, which you call decentralized capital. Could you tell us a little bit more about what you're trying to do with that? So the first thing to understand, and, and we touched on this earlier, is this notion of having a, a private currency, if you will. In this case, the idea is a token whose value is pegged at a, a stable value. And it's imbued with this value because it's guaranteed redemption on IDEX in lieu of trade fees. So how this will work is uh, users will be able to come to the platform and apply for a loan of these assets. Uh, they'll use their on-chain identity or perhaps um, a real-world KYC process in order to check their creditworthiness um, to make sure that we also have legal recourse in case they don't repay their loan. This asset will be a cryptocurrency that is, is uh, backed by a couple of different um, kind of collaterals, if you will. So one is backing by the exchange itself, by the exchange network. So this token will always be redeemable on IDEX at its target value in lieu of trade fees. So the concept is that if the price ever dips below its target value, traders will be able to automatically purchase this asset in order to lower their overall trading costs. So that will serve as a price floor to bring the asset back into, into stability. 
Now, the other interesting component is this notion of debt backing the asset. Um, so there's, without going into too much detail, there's a, a notion that you can think of debt and credit as just, um, and, and debt and currency is just kind of two different sides of, of the same coin. So, you know, when you create this currency, it's, it's, a, it's a debt that uh, needs to be, if you lend it out, it's a debt that needs to be repaid by the borrower of that currency. So if you can imagine this system is up and running, individuals are able to borrow this currency, use this currency to then go purchase goods and services, go about their daily lives. When they need to come back and repay it, they have to repay both the principal and the interest, in which case they're going to have to buy that currency off the open market from other individuals. Um, in doing so, that's gonna be another source of upward price pressure. In, in fact, if they're buying more to both repay principal and interest, you're going to need additional uh, currency in order to, to service that demand. So that's gonna be another component that will help maintain the price stability of the asset. And the real goal here is to give a worldwide stable currency that is separate from uh, government influence in terms of monetary policy. So as I mentioned before, we think this is a kind of a unique opportunity uh, both technologically and I'd say politically um, to try this, to, to revisit this notion of a private currency that's managed by uh, individual entities. So we've talked a little bit about this stable asset or stable coin. Uh, it's called Boreals. Is that the correct pronunciation? Yes, that's correct. Right. So, so you mentioned a couple of points. So you mentioned that this stable asset or stable coin will be backed by the revenues that you generate from the exchange and uh, there will be debt backing the asset, right? Yep, that's correct. But you also mentioned that these reserves will actually, the currency that these reserves will be kept in will be ether, right? To be censorship resistant. Yes. So one of the, one of the things that we are, I think this will be a component of research and um, kind of experimentation, if you will, is what is the necessary level of um, call it hard crypto collateral in order to to uh, give people confidence in this system. So just to give you a little bit of kind of the historical perspective, private currencies um, historically have had very, very low reserve levels. Uh, by that, I mean um, the private companies were able to issue much more currency than they had uh, in reserve in terms of either government notes or gold or whatever was being used to back the currency. And it, it really gets to this notion that a currency is really just a shared understanding of, its, of, of the value of an asset. You know, the paper currencies today are not backed by any collateral. It's backed by essentially confidence in the government that issues them as well as the economy with which they are tied to. Um, you can kind of think the, as, as the U.S. dollar, the, um, the value of it will fluctuate as the value or the, um, the, the success of the U.S. economy rises and falls. So we want to reimagine this for the decentralized economy. We want to have a currency whose value is um, kind of guaranteed by the fact that there are products and services on this network that are continuing to grow demand and continuing to grow users. And so really it's about um, taking this same notion, but doing it in a way that's decentralized and transparent in terms of supply and control. So the point I was trying to get to was that if you keep your reserves in Ether, and Ether, as we've seen over the last few months, it's quite volatile. So how do you manage your risk and ensure the solvency of decentralized capital? I know that you mentioned that in, in the quote unquote traditional world, the percentage of reserves is actually not that large. So you're actually kind of being conservative, but still, how do you manage the volatility in the price of ether? And I guess if you extrapolate this out, I think that you can get to a situation where there are no reserves necessary, that this is a system that is, uh, you, you can call it a fiat currency, but it's, I wouldn't say it's by force, it's, it's by opt in. And individuals, if you if you're able to get the kind of virtuous cycle going, the real challenge is how do you jumpstart that network? Um, you can imagine a virtuous cycle where individuals you, they they borrow it because they know it has value. They uh, repay it because there's real world consequences if they don't. And over time, you know everyone kinds becomes to to trust and understand 
uh, this, this currency is valuable, not only because it's tied to a growing uh, economy, but also because there's components of it that make it uh, easier to trust than traditional currencies. And by that, I really mean that transparency and openness component. So I think if you extrapolate it out, it's possible to get to uh, a situation like we have today with government currencies, but it's, it's issued by a private entity. So there's been a lot of chatter and talk about stable coins not being able to withstand black swan moments. Do you have any thoughts on that in respect to Boreal's? I think the thing that will differentiate the Boreal is the notion that the exchange network will always redeem it at its target value. And this is where, you know, if you could think of it as, you know, you mentioned being conservative with reserves. This is a way that we're thinking about being conservative with the supply. So imagine a situation where IDEX is doing $100 million in annual revenue. Um, people would probably feel comfortable if there was $100 million of this private uh, currency in circulation because it would take at most one year for the exchange to pull it out of circulation if, if all of that was used as redemption for trade fees. Um, and there's probably a level at which people would feel uncomfortable and it would start trading below par. Don't know exactly what that level is, but you can. we, we plan to use that as a component of how do we figure out what the right supply is uh, of this currency? And the idea is that if these, if, if individuals really want this and supply demand starts to outstrip supply, you can adjust the interest rate at which people are borrowing to help um, control it, to make sure that it doesn't get too rampant and uh, kind of that risk of the black swan event. Because from our perspective, the big risk would be if you have a system that just prints this, this currency uh, without end, as long as people want to borrow it, and then everyone wants to get back into crypto and get out of that currency, and the the system cannot absorb it. So that's kind of how we think about um, the risk component of this this system: is the supply relative to the ability of the exchange to pull that supply out of circulation. It sounds pretty good, and it sounds like you've put a lot of thought into it. Was this something that? you came up along with the team or did you kind of engage external service providers to come up with this whole ecosystem and how the, uh, how the token economics and how the whole uh, mechanism is going to work? So this is something myself and my co-founder really worked through. So he's the one who started doing a lot of research on free banking and really understanding the history of monetary policy and the fact that uh, the, the current system hasn't actually been this way for all that long. Um, so I think it's always, you know, understanding history and, and the progression to get to this point has been extremely helpful. And then on top of it, I think it's just been thinking about um, understanding like yeah, how this system is going to evolve and, and kind of our prediction of where it will go. And then really what is unique about cryptocurrencies that make this worth revisiting. And that's where uh, I mentioned it before. I think it's really there's a couple attributes that make blockchain a really compelling uh, component for this. So, so one is just the ability to issue these assets that can't be counterfeited. So the cost of actually issuing a currency and making sure that others can't create a copy of that and, and you know, generate millions or billions of dollars used to be very, very difficult. And now anyone can do it via a smart contract on a laptop. So that's one innovation that's made it easier for a private company to revisit this idea in this global, global kind of connected society that we have. The second property is just the openness and transparency of, of the blockchain. So anyone will be able to understand what the current system supply is, how that supply is being pulled out of the system, either through demand for loan repayment or through the exchange itself and having trade fees be, or the, excuse me, the currency be used to pay trade fees. And so you'll be able to, you'll, you'll be able to essentially assess the health of the system um, from a kind of an independent third party perspective. So we think that's kind of the critical second step to keep um, individuals or, or, you know, kind of this private currency from some of the, to, to, from being subject to some of the, uh, challenges that come from currency issuance today, which is basically who who do you answer to and what ramifications are there for uh, getting too loose with supply and monetary policy? No, I mean, I, mean, I think the whole thing sounds great. I mean, I, I wish it works out. 
I think it Thank remains you. to be seen, but I, I really do hope it, it works out. So we've talked about the stable coin in the ecosystem. You have two other tokens in your in the Aurora ecosystem. So there's the Aura token and IDXM. Could you talk about the role of those? So IDXM is a membership token. So we use this early on in order to uh, kind of generate additional revenue to help uh, with the development of IDEX. So once IDEX launched, we sold 2,000 IDXM tokens. Uh, each one gives the token holder three years of free trades, or at this point, about two and a half years. So through the year 2020, those who hold IDXM will pay no trade fees on IDEX. So this was kind of an alternative revenue model that allowed us to, instead of doing the a la carte pricing of other exchanges, to do this kind of all you can eat uh, buffet style or membership style approach to using the platform with really being two goals. One, bring forward revenue so that we could grow the team uh, early on, uh, which it was successful in doing so. We were able to sell all of the, all of the memberships. And then two, in order to make our products uh, kind of generate that core network of users who want to see IDEX grow because as more liquidity comes to the platform, as more trading pairs are available, their membership, they get more value out of that membership because they're able to, to have more of their trading activity on the exchange and they're able to save more in trade fees. The second token is called Aura, A-U-R-A. And this is the staking token of our future version of the IDEX network. So as I mentioned, currently the off-chain components of IDEX, the parts that interact with the smart contract, are operated by us on a traditional private server infrastructure. However, we think that we can maintain the UX benefits of our platform while still slowly decentralizing those components onto their own network. So one example of this and, and where we're starting with this is on the trade history. So on other exchanges, there's the risk of kind of market manipulation or serving up, you know, a trade history that maybe isn't accurate. In this case, everything on IDEX happens within the smart contract. So anyone is able to go to the smart contract and actually verify that what is being displayed is actually what happened. So we're planning to capitalize on that and take that component of the exchange, the trade history, and turn it over to its own network. So the idea is that nodes in the network will stake this Aura token, they'll have a client which will download the history from the blockchain, and then when individuals connect to IDEX, they'll get some of the information from us, but they'll connect randomly to one of the nodes in the network in order to get the trade history from someone else. So that will have a couple, primary, couple main benefits. So the first one is that it helps remove that risk of um, concern around whether or not this trade history is is honest. It's uh, you know you, we remove ourselves from that central point of kind of control. Two, it will allow those who stake the token and run this process to earn a percentage of the trade fees on the platform. So they'll be con contributing work, contributing computing resources to the network, and for that they will get a portion of the trade fees. The goal here being to use the token and for what it's really good for, which is coordinating a group of decentralized actors to all move towards the same goal. Uh, in this case, it's the growth of the network, the growth of the platform. Um, so if you are a, uh, one other thing to mention is if you're a trader on the platform, we actually distribute this token every month to those who trade proportional to your trading volume. So you can imagine this is kind of a virtuous cycle where the more you trade on the platform, the more of these tokens you'll be able to, to earn in the monthly airdrops. The more tokens you hold, the more you can earn as you perform work in the network and start serving up trade history. So it will be an incentive for individuals to uh, kind of grow the network, bring more liquidity, bring more of their trading, bring more of their friends, all the things that you want uh, for a product like ours, which is so dependent on the network effect. What's the highest trading volume that you've seen? And, and on average, like what kind of volume do you see on a daily basis on IDEX? It depends. So our volume was highest, not surprisingly, in around April and May, um, where we had hit our stride in terms of growth, as well as the kind of overall market sentiment was pretty positive. So being a, an Ethereum token exchange and, and only trading Ethereum-based assets, um, I think the ICO and token market 
is more volatile in, in terms of the impact of market sentiment. So when the market is positive, those tokens are uh, they're very much uh, the beneficiaries of that. Uh, when the market is negative, they're the ones that tend to cool off the fastest. That said, our volumes were around 20 to 25 million around that time, and anywhere from say three to seven million today. Um, the highest volume token, I'm blanking on the name, but it passed uh, 10 million in daily volume. Um, so we've certainly seen oh, wow. you know, many, many assets that, uh, given our infrastructure, we're able to handle that transaction throughput, and we certainly see demand that uh, you know, matches that of centralized exchanges. So I think there's a couple things we're really focused on to make sure that uh, the usability and, and we think in the future, the cost of using decentralized exchanges will come down to match that of centralized exchanges. Um, so, you know, once those, those UXs are truly on par, um, we think that it, for most people, uh, there's, a, there's a big value proposition to moving all of your trading over to a DEX. Are there any key things on your roadmap over the next three to six months? There's a couple of key things. So the, as I mentioned before, we're working on decentralizing the currently centralized components of IDEX. So it's going to start with that trade history and then move on to the other components, in particular, the dispatch process, as well as the order books. Um, so the trade history itself, this is kind of our first stage of staking, uh, which we plan to release uh, within that time period. The other thing is we're actively looking at other smart contract blockchains. So we think that uh, for now, the Ethereum network still has the dominant mind share uh, from both the developer and kind of customer perspective and that we still see most of the projects launching on Ethereum. However, there's a lot of competitors coming out that are getting their main nets live and we're, we're starting to see projects launch on those as well. So we want to take our architecture and adapt it for these other smart contract blockchains. And, and this is really a stepping stone to our future where we see that uh, we want to be a decentralized exchange that operates on all blockchain networks and really connects all of these assets uh, for, for individuals to trade in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. Are there any blockchains in particular that you're looking at? Uh, there are, I'd rather not say it this time. <laughs> because I was trying to fish it out. Uh, <laughs> all right, uh, so, you know, so in general, in the blockchain and cryptocurrency ecosystem, beyond what you're building, is there any project in particular that excites you? And I guess beyond Ethereum as well, because you're building on Ethereum. So I guess there would be some biases there. Yeah, it's a good question. So I think some of the things that we've been exploring recently that we think are pretty cool is, is how... Um, the kind of the intersection of the the old and the new and, and this is our focus has been on finance just because that's where our, our product is you know really going to live but i think it's it's going to you're going to see this pop up in a lot of areas and so you know one of the things we've seen recently is there's a company in and i think we talked about it earlier the notion of identity on the blockchain and they're taking a simple approach but it's it's surprising that to me guys that, that no one has done this yet where they're issuing a non-fungible Ethereum token, an ERC-721, to individuals who have been KYC'd on their platform. And that token will, will serve as a form of on-chain KYC, meaning that whoever holds that wallet, or excuse me, whoever holds that token, whichever wallet holds that token, can be assumed to be a representation or in control of the individual uh, represented by that token. Um, which really brings about some cool opportunities for us. So we're trying to figure out kind of where things are going to go in terms of additional assets coming on to the blockchain. So it seems likely that the security token market will grow. Uh, you'll start to see more traditional financial instruments brought to the blockchain. And with that, you're going to see the desire for regulators to understand, you know, if, if you have tokenized equity, who are the owners of that equity and, and making sure that it, it, it complies with uh, existing like OFAC regulation, for example. Very and so this, what, what's this the, problem. what's the, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Uh, they're still in, in beta. So okay. I don't know if they'd want me to, to talk about it, but I think this is an example of where we see uh, the interoperability aspect of blockchains really starting to reach their potential because we can then focus on the underlying technology and then regional or asset specific regulatory requirements can be kind of compartmentalized. So they're actually looking at having uh, 
you know, within some of the tokens, like two sets of whitelists, a, a US whitelist and a non US whitelist, such that US individuals can trade together and non US individuals can trade together. And th that's, th it's a really cool idea that within the asset itself, and this is kind of, I mentioned early on, what, what really uh, captured me to the space was the idea of programming information into the asset. And in this case, you can actually program regulatory compliance into the asset, which I think is, is fascinating because um, I think that's really how you get uh, governments comfortable with this technology and, and with uh, what it can do, um, while at the same time harnessing the benefits of, you know, opening up to many more people in the world, you know, anyone that has access to an internet connection. Yeah, the US is always causing trouble, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, we're, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting, I think, um, most countries seem to be watching what the U.S. is doing and, and seeing where they're, they're going to take it from a regulatory perspective. Um, I actually think the I've been pleasantly surprised with um, the restraint that the SEC has shown in terms of their enforcement actions are directed at clear frauds and scams, uh, individuals that are either blatantly lying about what the, the product is supposed to do or uh, doing so in such a way that it's, it's a clear violation of what they've they've kind of established in the past. So um, I think they no. My guess is no regulator wants to be the one that drives innovation off offshores, but they do have you know a mandate. So I think uh, they've been pretty judicious in their approach to it. Yeah, I think I would agree with that. Um, before we wrap up, is there anything that you would like to talk about that we may not have covered in the interview? I think we covered it all. So if, if you want to learn more about the project, you can check us out at auroradow.com. Uh, we're very active on Twitter. We also have a Discord community. So you can jump in and, and ask more questions if you have. Uh, if you want to learn more about the project, you know, how to participate as a, as a staking node in the future, uh, those sort of things. We have a, a very active team and community. So we'd love to see you there. Awesome. I'll include all the links to all the social media platforms. Um, I think uh, that's a great note to end the interview. Alex, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, Tishar. Appreciate was, the time. Yeah, it was fascinating, fascinating to have this discussion, man. And I wish you the best. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Like us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Telegram. And subscribe to our newsletter on decrypt.asia. This is your host, Tashar. Thank you for listening.